Welcome to Legends, a series that delves into the lore within Horizon Forbidden West. In this episode, we continue our exploration of the Acquisition Class machines that fueled and facilitated the terraforming of Earth post Pharaoh Plague. Within the machine ecosystem of the 31st century, where scavenger machines would salvage and recycle materials for use in Zero Dawn systems, these terraforming machines would gather resources for the system, while others work to detoxify and rewild the Earth's plant life. Let's begin with a machine that actually bridges the gap between scavengers and the rest of the acquisition class, the Spike Snout. I was conflicted as to which video to put this machine as it is a scavenger, as defined within the Forbidden West game guide, having the ability to scavenge machine carcasses using its chemical injector to extract resources. But I wanted to highlight this machine in particular, as it's unique among scavengers, as it also has the capability to process resources from the soil using similar means, often refining them into a liquid to fuel its many vapor capabilities. This also sets it apart from not only scavengers, but other acquisition machines, as this tasks the spike snout with support of its fellow machines, rather than just gathering resources strengthening them in several different ways, or weakening their enemies. This mist can be deployed ahead or behind the machine, draining stamina or damage output. Inversely, they can increase the damage output of its allies by 25% until its effects dissipate. The spike snout can also benefit from its own mist, quickly making them more formidable in mere moments than when originally threatened. These machines also harness acid capabilities to deal damage on their own, along with striking out with claws and its tail. These attacks can also disperse vapors unless the sacs storing the liquid are destroyed. This will make the machines and their allies easier to deal with in combat, but will make harvesting their sac webbing impossible. A valuable resource to many who choose to take on the Spike Snout. Another unique addition among the class is the Bristleback. Almost the inverse of the spike snout, in the sense that it can dig up scrap buried within the earth, but not for resource recycling. Instead, when a bristleback sniffs out buried salvage containers, they will bring them to the surface for collection. But with no means to break down or refine the raw material, this is where the process ends. Beyond this, they can use their tusk to unearth scrap for defense, infusing it with acid or fire to wound attacking machine hunters. Common throughout the Tanakh clan lands, for those able to override machines, the Bristleback can serve as a hardy mount, and for this reason, became a cornerstone of Regala's rebel lancers in her war against Akaro. These machines do not shy away from a fight, and will stand their ground if faced with a threat. Usually in small herds of two to four, it's advised to use stealth to bring them down undetected, rather than engaging in an all-out brawl with a group of them. Charging and thrashing with reckless abandon, those who plan on facing down a bristleback best prepare, ideally laying down traps and tripwires to turn the machine's aggression against it. Next we move to an all too familiar machine, the Charger. The one remaining mountable machine carried over from Zero Dawn to Forbidden West. Outside of being a mechanical steed for those able to override machines, the Charger is one of the many that collects, processes, and refines organic material into biofuel. The fuel we know as Blaze among the tribal populace is used for a variety of different purposes, from powering critical terraforming systems to later being weaponized by machines created by Hephaestus after the fall of Gaia. Tilling the earth with their chainsaw-esque horns, these lightweight machines are common throughout the world we know, traveling in herds for greater security. Before the extinction signal reached Gaia Prime, these machines were known to be docile and skittish when hunted by the tribes. In Horizon's present, these machines won't hesitate to fight back, known to be more aggressive than the Strider and Broadhead of the East, charging headfirst at their enemies or reeling back to strike with their metallic hooves. Removing their horns will not only gain you a prized resource, but also disable their main mode of attack. The next three, sometimes referred to as grazing machines, can also be found manufacturing resources from raw materials, each slightly modified from one another. Those being the Grazer, Lancehorn, and Fanghorn. Each uses their mechanical antlers and horns to till the earth, breaking materials down for refinement in different ways. Grazers and Fanghorn storing blaze 
purge water for fang horns as well, while lance horns store chill water. These machines are also naturally skittish, preferring for most of the herd to flee, with only one or two remaining to deal with the attacker. Each use their horns as their primary defense, but also kick out with their front and hind legs if threatened. The newest addition among the three, the Fang Horn, is the most formidable, with more than twice the HP of a Grazer, capable of harnessing fire into both melee and ranged attacks. Despite the dangers, these machines have often been sought after by machine hunters for their valuable resource canisters among the herds. According to Karja records, during the reign of the 11th Sun King, Marzid, Sunhawk Farukawaz once felled a herd of grazers so vast it was said one couldn't walk a single step without tripping over an antler of the fallen. However, this was pre-machine derangement, and if the Fanghorn is any indication, even these once fearful machines are only becoming more aggressive and dangerous. Both in the East and West, the Rockbreaker is a fearsome adversary, and one you might cross without even knowing it. Operating underground, it uses massive grinders and mining claws to bring valuable resources buried too deep for most acquisition machines to the surface. Beneath the earth, it glides with ease, and maneuvers topside thanks to treads beneath its claws. For hunters, its burrowing capabilities pose a difficult challenge, as damaging it consistently can't be done when it disappears underground. Before you know it, the Rockbreaker can emerge directly beneath you, biting and retreating quickly multiple times before you have a chance to retaliate. Or it commits to a single heavy attack, using an eruption of burning rocks like a small volcano. Things don't get much better at range either, as it can rain a torrent of rocks at the enemy from as far as 30 meters, forcing its attacker to cover or fall to the vicious bombardment. When it's decided to charge in for the kill, it also excels at closing distance, breaching from the earth like water diving at its enemies for the final blow. Despite its impressive variety of offensive capabilities, if a hunter can destroy its mining claws, it can no longer burrow, and is stuck in a sluggish state topside. So, prioritize hampering its mobility, and you just might live to hunt another day. Next are two machines specifically designed to enrich the surrounding ecosystem and promote continued plant growth, the Wide Maw and Plowhorn. Around many of the Earth's waterways, the Wide Maw uses its vacuum turbine to collect surrounding terrain and plant life into its body for processing. Once this is completed, this nutrient-rich fertilizer is packaged in specialized metal pods, then flung from its body from three resource ejectors. After several moments, these pods will then dissolve back into the Earth, revitalizing and enriching the soil a continuous process that aids in the revitalizing of the Earth's flora. Unfortunately, despite this noble calling, the derangement has also made the Wide Maw quick to attack. Designed as a tool to cultivate life, its vacuum turbine can also be turned against its enemies, either drawing them in to be crushed by the machine's massive jaws or turned debris into sludgy projectiles. It can also use the turbine to propel itself, leaping farther than it has any right to, creating a small shockwave on impact. When close, its impressive tusks are not to be taken lightly, and will charge with them until it's no longer in danger. Their tusks also make for a valuable prize for those who are skilled enough to remove them intact, but may force you to meet the Wide Maw head-on to line up the right shot. Another important ecosystem machine is the Plowhorn, both in function and tribal significance. When left to their designated function, plowhorns use their horns and split tail to till the earth as they move. As this happens, the ground is also fertilized, and seeds are dispensed from the launchers above its front shoulders and use their feet to plant a variety of other flora. Though these machines can be spotted in various locations around the west, a certain subset of them have come to carry great significance among the Utaru. When those of the tribe first came across what would become Plainsong, a group of plowhorns continued to cycle through the area that was once designed to be the autonomous farmland for Regional Command Center 9. These few were deemed as land gods, who supplied continued bountiful harvests for generations, a story that we'll explore further when we dive into the tribe itself. 
Though the land gods are mostly docile, those in the wilds will turn against attackers if threatened. Using its massive horns, the machine is also known to charge and slash when close and fling rocks and adhesive at range. Its tail can also strike with impressive speed, as the machine can spin some 270 degrees to slash at hunters who manage to avoid its horns. All in all, the Plowhorn is most content to be left to terraform, but if you must bring one down, you can stealth behind in the dust it kicks up when plowing to quickly get the upper hand. For our last two acquisition machines, we look to the water, as both the Snap Maw and Tide Ripper filter resources for various purposes, continuing the cycle of rewilding the planet. Gathering resources from waterways, the Snap Maw converts the liquid to steam. Once its dispersal tanks are filled, it will find a patch of land to expel the resources stored using its tail. Before the Earth was once again habitable by organic life, it's inferred that the Snap Maw worked as a means for the subfunction Poseidon to detoxify the world's water as well. After the vast amount of pollutants that were left in the wake of the Old Ones and the Pharaoh Plague. If left alone, one can observe the Snap Maw collecting energy from its solar panels during the day as it basks on the edges of rivers and lakes. Despite being quite bulky, these machines can pounce and bite with remarkable speed if provoked. From a distance, the Snap Maw can also lob mortars of frost or acid, depending on the variant. Usually clustered in small groups or patrolling beneath the water, it's recommended to tie down one if possible to be able to hinder multiple targets and focus one down at a time. Finally, we come to the heavyweight of the waves, the Tide Ripper. Able to effortlessly swim through the strongest underwater currents, using its serrated beak, it extracts sediment that is filtered into purge water and stored in various sacks throughout its body. When on land, it will continuously vent this purge water as a cooling mist to prevent overheating until it returns to the water. In combat, this makes the Tide Ripper resistant to fire and immune to purge water while venting. Inversely, this makes the Tide Ripper susceptible to shock and frost attacks. Offensively, it harnesses a variety of purge water-based attacks as well as those that take advantage of its massive size. Jet streams, neck sweeps, drill stabs, and body slams all must be avoided if you plan on making it out alive. If enough damage is dealt to the machine in short succession, this will trigger its water spin. Three pressurized water jets fire from its spinning tidal disc on its back, capable of striking hunters in a large sweeping area of effect. If hunting one, it's best to take some time to prepare, using gear that's purge water resistant and stocking up on cleanse potions to prevent dangerous buildup of effects. And with this, we conclude our second installment exploring the machines of Horizon, closing the book on the acquisition class featured in Forbidden West. Be sure to stay with us as we move on to our next group of machines designed for patrolling the wild, gathering of critical data, and alerting their fellow machines the Recon class. And with that, our journey comes to an end. If you'd like to see more content like this, likes and shares are always appreciated. And if you're hungry for more Horizon lore, consider subscribing and checking out the rest of our lore library. Also consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can keep making content just like this. Check out the link in the description. And as always, thanks for watching and keep questing.